Um, tonight, Karis and USSW presents May Day, Women Workers Lead to Struggle. We'll be joined by Monica and Diana, who will lead us in a, um, in a panel discussion, followed by a audience participation Q&A. Um, and so, yeah, I will be very brief. Um, May Day and the work that labor organizers are doing locally and across the South um, will be covered as well as like the historical impact of um, May Day, which is also known as International, Worker International Workers Day, which is a holiday to commemorate, commemorate the 1886 Chicago Haymarket Riot and the workers movements that have both flourished and suffered in the years since. The original May Day protests sought not only an eight hour workday, but to truly build democratic control of their workplaces. If you're not familiar, the Union of Southern Service, Service Workers is built by and for low wage workers across the service industry. They are building a union by any means necessary and building it in a way that makes sense for us. And with that, I'll let Monica and Diana take over. Thank you. Hi again, everybody. I also want to say um, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, super important that we commemorate International Workers Day. Um, and you know, a lot of people are at work right now. Um, so it's good to, you know, be able to come together with like-minded people and think about how we can make um, things better for workers across sectors across the world. Um, so yeah, we know um, as members of the Union of Southern Service Workers who focus on service work, um, low wage work, um, those uh, sectors, those places where we're told that it's not really possible to have a union. There's no reason, there's no, um, you know, you can't get contract, you can't, um, you know, have people stay in one place for a long time. Um, and so we're building a union that, you know, works for us, works for, um, the lives and the jobs and the needs of people who um, are not in these in the traditional you know union um, occupation. Um, so you know I think that's really the spirit of International Workers Day because celebrations, uh, commemorations take place in different ways in different places. Um, you know the Haymarket Affair um, is the root of um, it here in the United States. But um, across the world, workers have been in motion before then, since then, and will continue to be. Um, and so we have to think about like how we can make models that work for um, the specific conditions we're under now, um, which aren't the same as they were uh, back in the 1800s. Um, so that's recently talked a little bit about um, the Haymarket affair in general. Um, but I think one of the biggest things to uh, point out is um, that it was an issue, it was a moment of extreme repression. Um, you know, in um, those protests, wanting simply to be able to um, work a shift that doesn't require most of your waking hours, um, you know, breaking down your body so quickly, um, you know, people protested and people were shot and killed by, you know, um, basically private security for these corporations, which we're seeing, you know, in different ways um, right now. Um, and I think that that issue is part of why May Day um, is, a, is it celebrated officially in the United States. Um, you know, the hip market affair, um, the long story, um, bloody history of the labor struggle um, is something that, um, you know, agitates you. If you hear about that history, if you hear about people um, who, you know, are making all the profits uh, for these companies and these corporations, um, just, you know, demanding that they have an eight hour workday, um, demanding that they have benefits, demanding that they have retirement, um, safety on the job, all of those things, you know, have been, um, you know, stood against by these corporations on pain of death. Um, and so that really indicts, I think, our system um, and indicts um, the, the way that, you know, this union struggle and this labor stru struggle has taken place. And I think, um, you know, workers are always told that striking or any time a big union is thinking about striking, it's talking about how it's going to affect the working person, affect regular people, um, and affect um, 
and it's selfish and they want too much or whatever else. Um, when the real history is just people who are not able to survive at their jobs, um, you know, demanding their piece of the pie and often being killed or maimed or, um, you know, just even being fired um, is, is something that shows how little, the, how little space they want to give us um, as profits increase and increase. Um, so, some more notes. Um, you know, another thing about, Another thing um, that's very um, specific about Mayday in the U.S. is that, you know, we have, we have to do this. We have to create these spaces and these celebrations of protests um, ourselves because we have, you know, late the day, later in the year, um, a break from when the rest of the world um, celebrates Mayday. Um, and again, you know, the United States, Grover Cleveland, the president at the time, didn't want <laughs> didn't really want there to be international solidarity. Um, you know, we're made to think as American workers that we have it good, or, you know, um, even in service work, it's a side hustle, we'll just be there for a little bit. Uh, we don't need to strike, we don't need to demand better. But I think if people were, you know, made to know this history and fighting and um, celebrating the struggles of workers along with the hundreds of millions of people across the world that are locked in struggle, then it would be different. We wouldn't see ourselves as isolated, or we wouldn't see ourselves as um, you know being okay with the status quo. Um, and um, you know, it's obvious that it was a you know mass movement that um, brought the eight-hour workday, that brought weekends to us. Um, and the bosses, the corporations, that want to see that again. They want to see it, you know, isolated, small. They want to see it where it's just in your shop. They want to see it where it's just a new sector or just workers that you know are in one location. That's why we have you know the, the emergence of our service sector where there's only maybe five to ten people working at any time. Um, you know, you may not know your coworkers very well, you won't be there for very long. And so that makes it harder to do the the um, building of the labor struggle traditionally. And so that's why I think it's so important. Um, that we are doing what we're doing, and I'm so proud to be in struggle with, um, you know, chapter members here, Diana, different folks in the crowd, who are, um, you know, being very courageous and um, pushing for the labor struggle here in the South, because the South is so important. Um, so goes the South, so goes the nation, and we are building something new here, something very needed here with the conditions that poor people, uh, Black and brown people face in the South. Um, and so I think we're, you know, we are standing up, we're living up to the historical task that we have as workers. And we are, you know, fully connected with the um, international working class. So we're commemorating that here. Um, and we are, you know, pushing the struggle forward. I'll leave my part there. So hello everyone. Um, we are here gathered today, you know, to celebrate May Day and what it is about. It's about workers coming together and you know, pretty much standing up for their rights and for re their respect from their employers. So my name is Diana Rivera. I work at a Chevron gas station, and I'm excited to tell you about unions and how we organize. USSW is committed to cross-sector organizing um, in the service industry, such as fast food, restaurants, uh, retail, gas stations, and nursing home workers. Um, we organize across the South in Georgia, Alabama, North and South Carolina. Um, USSW is different from other unions that you may have heard of, such as Starbucks United or Amazon uh, labor unions. Even though we're all different companies um, and employers, all, employ all employees are facing the same issues. Um, such as low wages, uh, lack of safety protocols, and low voice at the job. So even though these companies 
are all for different companies, different jobs, different boards, different group of people. They're saying that, you know, every single job is facing these same struggles. And this is what unions are important, showing the importance of them. As a union, we set the demands that sets the standards for what we need from our jobs. We demand equal treatment, health and safety. We demand fair scheduling and fair pay. We demand respect. Correct. Mm -hmm. USSW is a multicultural and anti-racist organization. We understand the history's impact on the South, and we hope to get past the barriers that make it hard for workers to unionize here. Right to work laws are often thrown around, but many people don't know the purpose of these laws and was to deter workers from joining and supporting unions. By doing this, corporations have more control over workers and keep the status quo. We want to win structural changes in the South by putting direct pressure on our companies through supporting each other through our unions. We are the backbone of this country, especially brown, black, and indigenous workers. We're continuing the fight that many workers have pushed for internationally on this day. We aren't shared with much in American media, but workers across the world celebrate this day. The system is rigged against us. We're all working the most dangerous jobs and getting paid the least. But we have to remember these companies cannot run without us. We have the power to break the cycle. That's what May Day is about. We're here to fight and make a stand for our communities. So I just kind of want to share a little bit on what I just read. Um, you know, being part of the work industry, I have also faced a lot of these issues and I'm pretty sure a lot of y'all have and that's reason why you are all here. Um, but I don't know about you, um, I never even heard of May Day until actually very recently when I started to become more um, involved with unions. Anybody else here before? Did y'all hear about um, May Day and what it was about? Okay, so very little people have heard about it before. So, you know, that just kind of puts it in perspective on how hard these companies go to keep us oblivious because I really didn't even know this was celebrated internationally. And I'm just finding out, you know, recently that this is a major holiday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's my take from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think so. We'll split Zoom into kind of doing like a discussion, like with questions that everybody can engage with. Um, but just quickly on like the title, women workers um, lead the struggle. Um, you know, being a multiracial, um, multicultural, like trying to you know reach and organize and empower the most oppressed, um, you know, folks in this country uh, with USSW. Um, you know, it's very clear that women hold up half the sky and, um, you know, have to face um, very specific issues, you know, on the job, um, you know, whether it is childcare, whether it is sexual harassment, um, whether it is, um, you know, uh, the, the pay gap. Um, we're really seeing that um, women's issues, you know, in the um, traditional union structure sometimes get left behind. And a lot of times people feel like, women feel like there's no place for them in the movement. Like they don't have experience. They, you know, have too much to do at home. And so it's like very important to lift up and, um, and um, you know, support women in organizing um, because like out of those very intense struggles can be very intense gains, very intense organizing. Um, and so we know that, you know, some of our members have, um, you know, in different states, North Carolina, uh, Mama Cookie, different folks have been involved for like decades and made like real changes um, in their locale. 
Um, and if it weren't for, you know, putting that to the forefront on what we face, and like issues of safety, issues of, uh, you know, all the things laid out, um, we, would, we would lose a lot of people. Um, I don't know, Diana, if you've had any experiences. Um, working on the gas stations, it is kind of, um, one of my biggest issues for me has always been safety. You know, I don't know if many of y'all have constantly seen the gas stations are always in the news for robberies, shootouts, or any other crazy nonsense. And one of my biggest issues I have always been, you know, afraid of was definitely safety. There is no safety regulations and at there they don't have security, especially, you know, when you're working in rough areas, you do see a lot of things. And I feel like one of the biggest issues is definitely safety. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Okay. So we're gonna do questions and Patricia is going to pass around. Um, the microphone, so so feel free to um, so feel free to like respond to anything. We're just gonna kind of sit this up here. Oh, we're gonna sit this up here. Um, but the main question, first one, just have it up here, and I'll like write some things. Um, why don't we hear about May Day? And like, if anybody wants to share, um, what it was like the first time you heard about May Day, and um, like what effect it had. Your insignificance to you. So anybody feel free. And then if you could like introduce yourself with name and pronouns, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello everyone. I'm Luis. Um, pronouns he him. Yeah, so on the first day I actually heard, or the first time I actually heard about May Day. Um I can't tell you the exact day it was, but um, just like Diana, I had I was shocked that um, this is a holiday that's celebrated across the world and in the, this country um, we don't hear it that much. Um, so it's definitely um, you know it's kind of like that you know, kind of shocking moment to know like there's people out in the and like across the world also struggling for what we're doing. Um, it's that we gotta build that cross international worker solidarity as well because that's what made it you know kind of symbol like this hey my name is josh pronouns are he and him uh honestly the first time i heard about may day i didn't really think too much about like too much about like what it meant. I was like, okay, that seems a little bit strange that like we don't celebrate when it's so popular, but it's like over the years, learning more about like uh, other places where it is celebrated, it's like that were really cut off from like what really can unite us and kind of started like hurt over the years, realizing just how cut off we really are through like not celebrating something that's celebrated by workers all over the world that something we need to celebrate just to like keep us united. That took a little while to realize, but it's really powerful, like just how important it is we do celebrate together. Anything else? I did something here. Hey, I like it. It's for the people on yeah, for the people on the Zoom. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um anyway, so the first time I heard about May Day was probably like a few weeks ago, and mm -hmm. I didn't really know what it meant. Like I knew it was like something you know that dealt with workers, but I didn't know like the significance of it until actually was looking on it. I was like, oh okay, it is really like a big deal, but I feel like it should be you know, more put out there for like a bigger audience to see because I feel like something as significant as May Day should be celebrated by everyone all over the world because everyone knows everyone goes through the same struggles. So right. I feel like uh, it should just be, you know, the story should be told more. You know, I can, 
Yeah. Hello, my name is Joshua. He then pronouns. Um, I think one of the uh, major reasons that, uh, specifically in the United States, we don't talk much about May Day is um, kind of a product or a function of American exceptionalism. I think it got to what Monica was saying earlier. Uh, we really, even though many of us or most of us um, either have our own in our own personal work history, have service jobs or um, work directly in what I consider work work, um, or maybe even in our family, like those who are close to us in our immediate family have these types of jobs. Like Monica was saying, it's mostly, mostly seen as like a pit stop, as a place that we are using as a stepping stone to get somewhere else, even if that somewhere else comes next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, sometime after you get a college degree and work your way up to not be the most, wait, is this a PG-13? <laughs> <laughs> to not be one of the most shot upon in our society. And I think it's the, um, it is, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and so when, when you consider the fact that there is a uh, there has been and will continue to be a concerted effort to disconnect us from uh, the uh, third, third world uh, peoples, our brothers and sisters and siblings um, in other parts of the world who are directly impacted by our conveniences and comforts that we have, even as working people in the United States of America, there's this disconnect from the actual material reality of things. And I think that's a part of why we don't know about May Day specifically, but we don't have a, uh, a general international consciousness as to what connects us all as workers in this uh, capitalist society. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I think about when I first kind of learned about May Dertrecia, she, her pronouns, um, when I first kind of learned about May Day, I think it was around like 2020. And I remember understanding that like workers used to work like 16 hours a day. Um, but they never told you like how they went from working 16 to the so the so-called eight. Mm -hmm. Um, and that it was like actually one through protest and struggle. It was just like, oh, the government just like decided everyone works mm -hmm. eight hours now. Um, but I remember when I first saw a picture and it was like eight and three quarters, it was like eight hours of work, eight hours of leisure, and eight hours of sleep. And so being me, I love a list. So I wrote out like, okay, eight, eight, eight. I might, I might sleep eight hours, but I definitely work more than eight hours. And then I try to calculate like how much time does it take me to get to work? And I'm like, well, damn, I don't mm -hmm. live. So I work here um, in this building. I don't live near here because I can't afford to live near here. And so it takes me sometimes about an hour to come to work and an hour to get home. The other day there was an accident, so it took me two hours to get home. And so then when I calculated all my hours, I was like, well, damn, we don't get that leisure time. So what are they talking about? What did we actually win? We won a little, but we didn't win nearly as much as we could. And I think throughout the pandemic, I've been seeing different organizations try different things out like 32 hour work weeks, and then I started thinking like, dang, you can have a 32 hour work week. Well, yeah, because you can have a 40 hour work week because you didn't have that before, before mm -hmm. people were working much longer than that. Mm -hmm. And so I started, you know, just trying to think about like, well, what do I actually spend my time working on? Not a whole lot. It don't really take me 40 hours to do my job. I can really do it in less time and it can still pay me more money because they, they also don't pay me that much because if they did, I would be able to live down the street, mm -hmm. which I can't. Um, and so once I learned about May Day, I started to like just really think about what's possible. And the possibility is that you organize and you struggle for your actual rights and to get what you want because you make a demand and that your company is not just going to give it to you because you say you want it. They're going to give it to you because you demand it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even now having one this eight hours, like, yeah, we don't have that guaranteed eight hour shift. And do we have like leisure time as a right? Do we have any of the rights that, you know, when unions are really strong that like they won because they put these things into law, like federal law, NLRA, the um, National Labor Relations Act, 
because it was getting so intense in the labor struggle that they were like, they're going to overthrow the government. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a, po a point of when they had to give us, give us right down the rights that we were demanding and we were going to take. So it's like also like we've been rolled into a complacency of, you know, the government, we have a pro-union president or something like that. And the government's going to give us, um, you know, they're going to do the right thing, but they're not going to unless we do the right thing. So I'm going to take this one. Like, stupid something like that. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Okay. I mean, so. so, if we had, if we had, um, like, a nationwide strike, um, like, in the past, what would that be like? What would you think should be, like, demands if we did, like, a huge general strike? Nowadays, um, you know, like back then they were working, they were looking for the eight hour day. Um, what should be our demands now if we were to build, you know, hopefully we can build a nationwide strong labor struggle? What are the like primary things that we should be fighting for? Uh, hey, Mo. Uh, that's right, that's right, that's right. He, him, really. <laughs> um, I'll say the obvious one, um, higher pay. Because um, we're talking about like, you know, like shorter hours and everything. But honestly, if I got less hours on my job, I can afford anything. Mm -hmm. more shit. You know, I, I have to at least get my 40 hours. And um, I feel like a decent pay isn't really asking for much. I mean, I come to work, I'll make them. Um, Ten thousand dollars that night, and I walk out with the crumbs. You know, I mean, ten thousand dollars for the company. Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that one night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's it. Okay. Okay. Hey everybody, I'm Keisha. I'm one of the organizers with USSW. And my pronouns are her and queen. And definitely, we definitely need health care. I mean, they work our asses to death. And you know, under these unsafe um, conditions, um, exhaustion, heat, all of that stuff. So, you know, a lot of us are just walking around here, you know, just sick, um, burnt out. Just you know, it's COVID, all these different viruses coming up, and we need um, better medical attention. And as a woman in the workforce, you know, women need special um, attention. We give birth. Um, we have different if issues. Um, with our health, and so we need that. So we need to demand that um, now, not even wait till it's, you know, um, all of us together. We just need to do it now. So that's the main thing I would say. Well, one thing I think I would say would be oh, you both, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, Andy, uh, keep him, uh, sorry, for that. I think something that would be really good would be like better or higher uh, safety precautions at work. Because at the particular place uh, I work at, it's like a plastic manufacturing. And uh, many of the workers on the second floor work with pigments that are constantly flying through the air. And I know one person who's working there, not anymore, obviously, because he was bleeding from his nose. Huh. And <laughs> yeah, so I'd say better just an actual health inspector, you know, go into our workplaces and actually do a good job or do their job, you know? I feel like one of our chapter members should talk about a complaint we delivered to OSHA. Okay. Um, hey, Luis again. Um, one thing, um, if we were to do a national strike, I think one thing as workers we should uh, demand respect. Uh, demand that they acknowledge that we are the ones making their wealth. And without workers, they wouldn't have the luxury they have. And, you know, respect just means, like, of course, all everything that we need, livable wages, health care. That's what I mean. Because I worked at Panda Express for three years, and how they treat you is not how anyone should be treated hmm. because you do so much work for them. And in return, all they do is just, <clears throat> if you quit, they'll hire someone else, pretty much. You're like, you want to leave, then leave. 
we're we're trying to change that by making these type of service jobs into big union jobs. But I think respect should be one definitely one of our demands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, my name is Erica. I use she her pronouns. Um, I believe that one demand for the strike should be uh, guaranteed employment. I believe that a job is a right that everyone has. Um, you know, not everyone, not everyone can work right now, and it's because there aren't jobs that are available. I think one thing I saw once that really hit me was so basically you said like, you know, just take a walk down your street and look at the condition of your park. You know, there's trash everywhere. Probably everything is falling down because it doesn't work. You know, the issue is there's so much work to be done, and there are people that can pay for it because there are billionaires that exist in society. So a job should be guaranteed that can help your community. I feel like discrimination upon race should be something that's that we should do. And that should be like a matter of topic. Because uh, even just with our work experiences, you know, being an, an African American male working in a in a uh, in an intelligence is not the best thing to do. But it's the best thing in general because you know they just don't they just don't care. And just like not just McDonald's, but any working place in general. They just don't care. And I feel like, you know, how are you going to treat us like that? We're working for you. You know what I'm saying? We're making your money. So the least we can get is some proper treatment. Like, I feel like we shouldn't be paid less because of our skin color or because, you know, because of, you know, our race or just anything in general. Like, we shouldn't be denied fair rate. We shouldn't be denied fair opportunities regardless of anything. Yeah. And discriminating against race, gender, sexuality, and ability. Um, I feel like we should we should demand to be treated as we are not. Because, okay, don't discriminate against somebody just because they have a disability or they learn differently than you. You right. just, you, I was unique, but you treat me like the blood on the bottom of your shoe mm. because you don't like my color or because, oh, you don't know the difference between odd and even, but I'm stupid. I'm far from it. <laughs> but I feel like everybody has, everybody deserves the opportunity to learn to work and give them the ability to be able to do something because it helps people who have disabilities or people who don't learn, who have learned learning barriers, it gives them the confidence that they always want and they long for. And they feel like they do something, they're like, ooh, I just did that. That's a that's a big milestone for people who have disabilities or people who struggle with learning different things that you need to be learning. I feel like a lot of companies and other places Look at people and be like, oh, she got this, but he got this, but oh, he can't work with me. Oh, I can't deal with that. That's just too much. You're doing too much because you're judging a book. You're judging a book by the cover, not allowing this person to come into the company. They could be a great asset to the company. They could turn the company flip flop around and be making millions of dollars when you up here making twenty dollars. They're making millions of dollars, mm -hmm. but she wanted to discriminate. Don't judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, Joshua, Kibe. Um, I got two things that I really think about when I'm um, talking about a you know, nationwide general strike. Um, one is I believe that all public companies should be required to have a significant voice in the slash vote uh, for the workers at the shareholder meetings. Um, I think that's a huge thing um, that is actually something that can be executed and implemented. Um, I think with our system, specifically in the U.S., it might be more difficult to institute that across all private industry, uh, but many of us um, either work for or are impacted by 
public companies, and I think that would uh, begin to uh, break uh, some of the open collusion, quite frankly, uh, that capitalists have against labor. Um, and the, the second thing, I think there's an interesting um, talking point that came about throughout um, the uh, first couple of years of the pandemic, uh, specifically around unemployment income, where um, in many media outlets reported that people were making so much money on unemployment that they wouldn't go back to work. And I think that that is, um, that is something to talk about and that's something to demand where the uh, federal government, I think, should guarantee income, I'll come around to this, um, so that if you want me to work for you, you have to pay me more and treat me better than if I just stayed at home. I don't think that is a ridiculous notion. I don't think that is something that will uh, drive, well, first of all, I mean, you don't like to get rich. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> if you were rich, you got richer. Mm -hmm. But if you were getting by, you were able to pay your bills. So that's the first thing is that it is a, um, quite frankly, not even a revolutionary way to uh, to keep the economy going, so to speak. Um, but I think it puts a demand on capitalists to say, we have to treat people well, and we have to pay them adequately. And that would be uh, my little one-two punch. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, Gerald, he and pronouns. Um, I think a uh, demand is that we need to make is uh, for uh, fair and safe work conditions at work. Where um, I work at Waffle House, and uh, a lot of known people that have been uh, shot at while on while working at Waffle House, and and how they and how dangerous it can be there. And like recently, when we went on strike, um, I delivered a, uh, a like a letter to Appliance OSHA to, to make, demanding for like safer working conditions, where like where where members of our union in uh like in North South Carolina, they had uh, on, on, they've had all kinds of different um unsafe unsafe conditions that are like have been just de like, deteriorating because mainly because of the investment within Black communities and and the communities of people of color. So I think that like, you know, if we have a, a nationwide strike, uh, we need to hold, hold these companies feet to the fire and say that like, uh, the, the buildings that you have us work in need to be safe. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. I think something that Queen, um, over here, I forgot the name, but Queen, <laughs> Lakeisha. <Lakeisha's> pronoun. Um, <laughs> kind of alluded to earlier too, um, pay parental leave. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you give birth or if you're a parent period, you yes. should have the ability to have time off to be with your child Definitely. or your dependent. Yeah. Especially if you want to force you to have it. Come on, no! Come on the tree. Mm. Um, and as she heard they pronounce, um, I think if the, there would be a nationwide strike, um, one thing people definitely need is like mental health days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, um, kind of like I believe Josh said, like just having like a universal base income where people can like exist and then be free to like add on to the productivity of society while also, um, I forgot her name, but uh, just like giving everyone the opportunity to both work. Uh, make money, get money to live, and like um, be able to like thrive in their own like mental space in their own life uh, in our livelihood. So we can like choose like who we want to be and like what part of society we want to contribute to instead of being like you know like robots of the system. Um, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you, Keenan. Um, I think an important one would be, um, you know, reasonable workloads or like an end to short staffing. Um, I've been in food service for a long time, and uh, people people are really mean when they're hungry, you know, um, <laughs> and that uh, that hurts after eight hours of people, you know 
They ordered 30 seconds ago and they already want their bagel. Like, <laughs> calm down, people, man. We need more people to be able to handle that. We get done with the shift and like, there's days where like, I feel like I don't, I don't like myself at the end of a shift like that because it makes me grumpy. It changes who I am, you know? So, um, yeah, reasonable workloads. They're just trying to uh, squeeze as much work out of us as possible. Mm -hmm. And so and this can lead to uh, safety things too. I'm like wow. slamming espresso to be able to keep up with things. And, you know, if there's a wet floor by the dishwasher or something like that, you're in a big hurry. It's easy to slip and fall. All kinds of bad things can happen. So, yeah, end to short staffing, um, reasonable workloads. Yeah. Yeah. Demands here. I think it really, um, you know, flies in the face of whatever mythology there is about um, just being the best country in the world to work in. Because <laughs> so many other countries don't have to worry about this stuff, and at least they're like government, you know, bodies actually um, enforce some of these things. Because we have supposedly we have OSHA, we have all of these different boards to prevent discrimination, to prevent. Uh, people from being injured or dying on the job, but it still happens all the time. Um, we delivered a complaint in North Carolina because OSHA there does not do um, inspections of um, like fast food places like on a regular basis as it should. There's been like, I think like zero or one like across a year unless there's a complaint. Um, in a, you know, and that's a sector where more black workers work in. They're doing like constant inspections and like construction and things that white workers are in, but um, leaving those that are in the worst jobs to suffer. And, um, you know, there's no reason why people should, you know, have to die or be injured on the job. Um, in 2023, all of this, you know, information, this technology is out there. People know how to keep workers safe, but they don't do it to cut costs. Um, you know, whether it's the short staffing or whether it's, you know, letting people work with toxic chemicals there's someone else in the room that had to deal with that recently if they want to speak to it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like a whole part of the job, like someone was talking about, oh, you know, the plastic and stuff, is just ruining your lives. So, like, what, what is that? And how can, you know, a company be allowed to continue just ruining the lives of people, um, you know, as part of their, like, business model? I don't know. Um, okay, yeah. We can move on to the next question. Do you want to read the question? Yes. Okay, so how would things be different if workers knew their rights? Mm -hmm. So like your co-workers or workers in general? Like what? Uh, my name is Pablo, uh, he, him. It's all for me. They would know what rights to demand. You kind of got to know where you're standing to know where you're going. And if you know what rights they have, they know what rights they don't have, which is, you know, I think a lot more important than just knowing what rights they have. I mean, if they know what rights they have, they can obviously uh, fight to have those rights of force. But I mean, if you if you don't have the right to to guarantee, you know, roof over your head after working forty hours a week, it doesn't matter how many rights you know. That's a very important right. So I think that's that's one of those things. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, I already said that early on. Um, I feel like it made the biggest difference to me. I worked so many jobs where I just, they all worked me. So I ended up working maybe eight hour shifts, get maybe a 10 minute break. And I assume that's, that's just the industry, you know? That's how it goes. You're working hard and you're supposed to work hard. But um, knowing my rights is the reason why I actually got into wanting to reunite service jobs. Because honestly, things like unions, they're meant to educate you. Um, 
I don't know what's going with this. I just, I'm just talking now. Um, <laughs> um, I feel like knowing your rights is the difference it'll make is that it gives workers power. Um, knowledge really is power. Um, I feel like management and ownership understand that. So they try their best to keep workers ignorant. They try their best to hire ignorant workers. And they'll do everything in their power to make sure we don't know what we can do, what we can't do. And bad transition, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, or I feel like people that are in the food service, I'm in the food service, and people get really abrupt about their chicken. They just knock off the chicken and they don't go. <laughs> and they threaten you, they throw things at you. Um, I just feel like a lot of that we have to deal with as food service workers, as far as what we're entitled to and how we should be treated and what we deserve on a, as, as a worker, as someone who is working so hard. And I feel like if we knew what we were entitled to a break, a 30 minute break, it shouldn't have to take somebody coming in the door to. That's related to me. About that. Um, my sister's my sister. I love her from the tip of my shoulder to the root of my right hair. And she came to the visit me the other day, and I was in the window, and I was working there. And she asked me, she said, um, "What are you gonna get? A, are you gonna get a break?" I looked at her. She looked at me. I looked right at her. She looked at me. And so I went in the office and I said, "Um, I'm gonna get a break today." My boss was sitting at the computer. <laughs> and if my sister hasn't came in there and forced the issue of me getting a break, I wouldn't got Because a lot of times I work, I work from 10 30 until like six o'clock. I don't get no break. Mm -hmm. I don't even need to put a chicken leg in my mouth. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the fact that she knows that. She knows I'm entitled to one, so she feel like she doesn't have to, or she doesn't have enough people to hold that position. Then, oh, I ain't gonna worry about her. But you know, I have health issues that require me to eat, and I have medication that I have to take. Yeah. And I can't take the medication if I don't eat. And you, you prayed on that, or you use that to your advantage, and I don't feel like that's fair. Because that goes back to what I said earlier. They think I'm stupid, but I'm not stupid. I'm very intelligent. And I'm, I feel like a lot of people, if they knew their rights and knew what they were entitled to, and that's what I think I love about this union is because it gives people who don't know how to speak a voice mm -hmm. to be able to say, okay, she may not know what wife to say. She may not be sure about what to say or how to say, but I got her. I got her back. Let me, let me say this. Because I'm not gonna let you do blah 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 blah. Because she wasn't like that happened. Uh -uh. She said, like, excuse me, you're gonna give my sister a break, right? She was like, oh sure, I'm gonna get in the window. She got that door so fast. Because she knew my sister don't play that. Mm -hmm. her queen don't play that by her sister mm -hmm. knowing that she's a wicked here. Oh, what are or how would things be different if workers knew their rights? Uh, I want to first. I want to say we wouldn't be here right now if if all the work be done. Right, we would not be here because mm -hmm. let's just be real. Anytime people get some power, government can't do that. Let's be real. Like anytime the people decide to, or they want to make change or they want to take initiative, let's be real. What 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 answer do the government really give? Honestly, so uh, I just feel like if all workers knew their rights and really knew uh, what you know, what to demand and what to expect from going in to your nine to five or even longer, we wouldn't be here right now. It will bring us more united. It will have us all stop so much of, I guess, looking into. Other things that's not really helping, I guess, like violence. 
sluts each other. More so to say. I didn't want to. I didn't want to go there, but violence sluts each other. More so to say, it would help. It would help other people focus more their more of their attention on trying to get the rights and trying to push that instead of how we were doing other things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's really yeah. 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 I feel like that's why they try to keep us from knowing what our rights are because they know we know it's over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Hello. Hello. Um, uh, I think if uh, workers really knew their rights, um, I have a strong belief that quality of service and products actually would increase mm -hmm. uh, because we, I mean, we just want to do our job wrong. You know? mm -hmm. And um, when I was working in, uh, in a grocery store just really until recently, uh, where we were treated like shit um, by not just quote unquote management who didn't understand that they were workers as well. Uh, why then? <laughs> the district manager comes in the store and all of a sudden you turn into one of us, you know? It's kind of crazy. Um, you know, but, you know, so treat it for the garden and then also by the folks who felt like, well, this is my neighborhood and this, you're here to serve me personally. That's weird. Um, and I think people don't realize that some, uh, several people brought up uh, how a conversation needs to actually work or happen. Um, their hours can be tied to work and happiness, how safe work environment is tied to work and happiness, how your quality of service, care, product is tied to work and happiness. And so even just simply just saying, hey, look, if we treat workers better, if workers do their rights, exert their rights and expand it on their life, in general, maybe you'd have a better experience. That's something that I think that a lot of people don't think about. And mm -hmm. the thing that really makes me sad is worker on worker crime. Mm -hmm. um, because I think a lot of times uh, what we see is uh, people who presume to have, presume themselves to have limited power. And maybe that's true as individuals, uh, but collectively obviously we have power. Um, I think tend to reflect the, um, the things that they see um, that they need to act out in order to get their way or to get some respect. And I think that's really what everyone is trying to get. They're trying to get respect, especially when you're not making a lot of money. Um, so the money that you are partying with, you're like, I need it to be, I need to be treated with respect, but it's $20 for this mediocre ass meal. You know? So that's the thing. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? I know I always think about when I worked at Moe's um, with the burritos, Mo Mondays, true hell. But um, I just remember like I worked in Brookhaven when I was at Oglethorpe, and that was a different, I hated it still, but that was a different experience than when I worked at Morrow, like a black community. Mm -hmm. And you think about like, you know, this is a $5 burrito, but I could just see the stress emanating off of you, you know, and you want me to fill this bag to the top with tortilla chips and like I'm pissed you're pissed but like you know your conditions are worse and but yeah it's like the the uh, blame gets put on the worker mm. I'm not smiling enough for you when I made mm. this burrito versus like the fact that you like have to think about what you do with this five dollars um so yeah anybody else uh I think I'll start over again. Um, I think if workers knew their rights, then we'd have a end to tip service, like because um, I I've uh, like I said before with the Wealth House, but I also not only but I also worked at a pizza and as a delivery driver, and like you know you think you, I make four fifty an hour while well, on while driving and. Mm -hmm. And, and everybody knows, like, you know, doing delivery driving puts a lot of wear and tear on your car. Mm -hmm. And it's not, um, you know, it's not so, something you can make this for we make 450 an hour. And uh, a lot of people that, like, and a lot of servers at Wealthhouse, they make, like, about 315 or something like that an hour. And um, that's not, that's not like, and they, and they say things like, oh, you make tips and you can, like, make something like, 
600 a week or something like that, which is bullshit, by the way. Uh, but like, um, but you can't plan your life when you're when you go from having like something like maybe a good week where you make like 300 dollars, but then you make a bad we have a bad week when you make like 150 or something like yeah. that. So like, how do you plan your life? How do you like, how do you like have a stability in your life when? You, when when there's tipped wages, in my opinion, there's no. If we need to get rid of it. It needs to be abolished. Hello. Oh, uh, I think I have an idea. So can you read the question again, please? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not holding it well. How would things be different if workers knew their rights? I think uh, one thing that would be really different, like for example, in my workplace, um, many of the workers there are undocumented, and mm -hmm. the company knows it. They act like they don't know it, but they do. And they purposely take advantage of this to hire them and just fill out the ranks. Like before, I think uh, many of the wages will be very much higher. And for example, with the cleaning lady, I know specifically she was getting paid like 14. And now the new cleaning lady, 12. Yeah. yeah, and just like every time they hire new people, do they just keep undercutting and making use of third party staffing companies? But the thing is, is like many of the workers, uh, they don't know that they can actually come together and organize because they think, oh, maybe the company's going to send ice on me, maybe I'm going to get deported, what's going to happen to my kids, you know? And you know that's something that at least I've been like saying that when I explain this to my coworkers that it's illegal for that to happen, they can't do that. You can't use eyes or the police to intimidate you for organizing. All of a sudden, it's just like, oh, like mm -hmm. really, you know? Mm -hmm. And then they start, you know, thinking and talking amongst each other about the things they can do. I think it's going to be different. Yeah. <laughs> There's someone else? Uh, there's someone like, oh, so far. Oh, well. Cool. Um, well, yeah, that was great, too. It's a part. I think the last question we can go over, and then we can just do some general, any other comments or questions or whatever. It's like, um, in the worker struggle, like, what gives you hope? Or what are some things, you know, you're local or global um community things you've seen that like gives you hope for the struggle and uh you know makes you believe that we can win um uh, again uh, the wave of unionization across the country is one of those things it tells me that mm -hmm. workers are starting to you know get tired of being stepped on and uh, organizing uh, they are you know uh, Atlanta's currently uh, there, there's work on building a workers' assembly in Atlanta at the moment with the uh, Southern Workers' Assembly. Uh, you know, I mean, Amazon unionizing is a huge victory. So, mm -hmm. I mean, seeing, seeing the fact that workers are starting to, uh, you know, flex their rights definitely is not over. Specifically, I just want to put a term to the process you were you were describing. Uh, I would describe that as labor militancy, right? Mm -hmm. Labor sensing its own strength um, and just not willing to be dealt to the bottom of the deck right. um, as they have been for so long. Um, so, as uh, as people's consciousness changes, we're going to have more people in the struggle, more resources, mm -hmm. which means more victories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Luis again. Um, yes, um, that gives me hope. The militancy that the working class are starting to realize. Um, I don't know how people perceive or I mean, like the working class, but the working class is like this sleeping dragon and it slumbers. Real soon, this dragon is going to wake up and it's going to take action. <laughs> and what gives me hope is these type of spaces, like these unions because they actually build that worker solidarity. Um, and, you know, we're here because we acknowledge that we're the workers and we have the power. Yeah. Um, and that's why we should always like, you know, respect one another, of course, because, you know, 
they what they want is divide among us. So this gives us gives me hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. so the whole union, the whole worker solidarity that we're seeing rising in the US. Um, I would just like to say the fact that you all decided to come spend your evening here mm -hmm. after probably working all day to come and talk about and celebrate May Day and to discuss um, how to make your workplaces better and how to make the world better, that gives me hope. Yay. Anyone else? Y'all ain't hopeful? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just want to say that the fact that people care is real. Like, the fact that we're even having this right now shows that you know, that people actually do care. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are just growing. So, I mean, they just keep pushing. Is all I can say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Smith is just learning about the history of labor organizing, especially within the United States. Um, like specifically, I'm reading the autobiography of this guy named Angelo Herndon right now, who was a labor okay. organizer in Atlanta, actually, and Alabama back in the 1930s. Um, but it's really crazy to, to, to read about his life because back in the 1930s, you know, part of his whole thing was that he led some of the first racially integrated strikes, but talking about his life, he basically says, like, I was arrested pretty much every time I left my house, <laughs> you know, and reading about his, reading about his life, and he talks about he had meetings just like this 100 years ago, and like 100 years ago, you couldn't have a meeting like this without the police, like, literally busting on the door mm -hmm. and arresting all of us, wow. and it just, like, it's so inspiring to know that for literally hundreds of years, people have been putting their lives on the line because they knew that the next generation wouldn't have to struggle like they did every day. They knew that the next generation wouldn't have to work 16, 14, even 20 hours a day sometimes. They knew they'd be making more money. And so what really keeps me going is just knowing that there is someone who is passing the torch to us right now, and we're gonna pass the torch to the next generation. Okay. Anyone else? I actually want to share something. Um, what gives me hope is, you know, like I had mentioned, and a couple other people here mentioned, I've never heard of May Day. A lot of us never even heard of May Day. It's the fact that, you know, we're starting to realize just how important, uh, you know, a holiday like this is today because it brings people together and it makes you realize you know it is it is important it is a major holiday it is something that more people should know about and now my question to you is how what are you going to do to bring more people here on the next May Day mm -hmm. because you know even though we have heard all of us are different jobs different everything you know mm -hmm. with different backgrounds but we're all facing the same issues at work mm -hmm. so this is not a battle that only is for retail or gas stations or fast food this is a battle that is for everyone across the globe mm -hmm. so that's that's just my you know my little two cents on it <laughs> um so yeah, you know, just learning and just pretty much seeing, you know, this, it's it's bigger than we think. Mm -hmm. Because here in America, let's be honest, you know, a lot of these things are fairly new. They are. And, you know, I feel like it's really up to us to continue to, you know, make it more known and to really put our input into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got a meeting to get more people out. Yeah. For the next week day, Labor Day, next month, your birthday. How <laughs> to get people out? I'll tell everyone I know.
ones like thinking about maybe like making a chart of your workplace like who's with it who's pissed at the boss who's the boss's bestie you know who is saying they got a side hustle or whatever so they don't care or whatever that's like we call that workplace mapping like, you know who who works on the shift with you who works on the day shift the mid shift and um you know how what are their issues what are, um, like, how likely are they to want change? Or are they, you know, very in bed with, this, with the system? Are they the manager or whatever else? Are they related to the manager? Versus, like, the folks that you complain with every day, like, you're always talking shit about the boss. Like, how can you get them? What's their, like, main thing that can get them, uh, you know, to come to an event and to um, help organize, rather, demand letter, things like that? Um, so that's a tactical. Um, any other things people are inspired to do or questions? Sorry, I'll talk a lot. Um, <laughs> Let's one, get into one thing that I find that gets people interested in uh, in the movement is that um, this in the story of labor organizing, letting them know that you know we didn't, we didn't just pop up and then things were like this, and you know, and it's always been like this. You know, there's been there's a struggle and and we fought, but. I mean, you could you could be working 16 hour days, you know, you could be, you know, you could have no weekends. It could be worse and it's not worse because people organize and fought for the things that you like. So if you want more things that you like, you gotta you gotta jump on and organize with us, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important, like we were saying earlier, like we're kind of cut off from history on purpose by like the education system and how this isn't even you know, there's so many like crazy holidays on like my Apple calendar, but like May Day doesn't even <laughs> pop up like this. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like um, I think on our Instagram, like I saw the other day, I didn't even know about this. In Atlanta, there was like a church's strike in 1972 where they were like, they want health care, health care benefits um, out of churches in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's like, we don't have that now. The church is not here. I don't care now. Mm -hmm. So, it's like making people see like we're part of this historical struggle and we're part of, we're putting on like the, the banner, we're standing on the shoulders of the civil rights movement, you know, especially here in Atlanta where everybody's like, oh, fuck you, good. Um, uh, MLK or whatever. Like, what was MLK doing when he was killed? Mm -hmm. supporting, yeah, right. yeah, supporting that Memphis um, sanitation workers strike. So if we believe in what he did, if we believe in what that we, you know, especially black people, brown people, like nobody wants to live in a world that the civil rights movement didn't happen. But, you know, right now, if we like let things go as they are, we continue to get pushed down in a way that, you know, it's not the exact same way, but we're still in a place where it's getting almost semi-feudal sharecropping, you can't yeah. afford to live in your house, you can't afford to have a car, you don't own anything, mm -hmm. you know? So we have to think about like, are we okay with how things are? And we also have to like, take the wool off our eyes that things will just stay fine, things will stay okay, whatever. Cause you know, we may not be organizing, but the bosses are mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Every day, every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. I think we can just do like basic comments, questions, any Q and A um, that, or um, you know, anything people want to say um, before we close. It's, you know, full night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Joshua. Um, what one of the things is um, in the last year or so, I worked as a teacher, delivery driver, and grocery store. Um, call it clerk. Basically, you are loading stock on the service floor, on the on the show, sales floor. Um, 
One thing that I could not figure out is kind of getting to what you were just saying is how do you even begin the conversation in the workplace? Because basically folks were not getting enough hours to begin. Like you're not getting paid enough. And then you're like, I'm trying to get more hours. So off the bat, it creates an interesting dynamic where people aren't really trying to create too much way, make too many waves. But then on the other hand, you got a situation where folks are not being treated well, like there's like, you know, kind of obvious divide and conquer tactics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the stuff that I think we all experience to some degree, um, especially in service work. Um, so it's like, how do you, how do you kind of see an organized, especially in a, um, a repressive state like Georgia? Um, yeah. I think it's um, like, it's like, I could say an answer, but it's the implementation, of course. But I think, you know, practicing, like we do, you know, practicing organizing conversations and practicing, you know, going into a conversation with like, what do you want to get out of it? So thinking about, um, you know, what is this person likely to say or what is they, what do you know about them already? And that's part of workplace mapping. I think like, what is, you know, you know, this person like needs more hours or whatever. So, you know, you know that because you spoke to them or you heard them talking about it or whatever. So, I don't know, it's, it's kind of basic, like, or you start with, you know, what's up, how you doing, I'm fine, yeah, it's just, you know, rough over here, um, you know, I need more, they might say I need more hours, and you're like, yeah, me too, crazy that they want us to do so much, it's a little time, et cetera, et cetera, and just kind of go from there and you know you might have a goal of having a meeting outside of work like getting the phone number you might have a goal of you know going to uh you know going somewhere together like to have dinner have lunch or whatever and and chill and like get to know them better um which also goes a long way and like you know having like a robotic conversation is different than are you checking the boxes is like different than like building trust with a person so that they actually are listening to you. Um, and also not thinking like if they rebuff you one time, it's over. Um, yeah, that's why you've done it. Uh, I want to say, uh, I was just going to say to what Monica would add on to what Monica was saying, like try to, don't try to force the um your co-worker into trying to do it like if they if you realize that they're not you know really going for it or down for it don't try to force it down the throat because at the end of the day you don't want to make it seem like oh well you have to do it because we both making the same work decision no she doesn't or he does not have to jump but when you're trying to explain it to them just like try to be try to be yourself like talk to them as if they're just your coworker. Don't try to talk to them as if you're, you know, hired yeah. because you're a part of the union. Don't do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To the end of the day, Fine. you're still a worker, regardless if you're a part of the union or not. Mm-hmm. So coming at them as a worker, worker to worker, being yourself is the best way to address a, a um, coworker on trying to start a union, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, does he have other hands? Cool. Well, um, in that case, I think that's like, you know, the basic question all the time is like how we can build a space where we feel confident having conversations with folks about that type of thing, um, where we like, you know, have practice, where we, um, you know, can study different strategies, what works, what doesn't work hear from people's experiences together. So I think having this type of event is like building, you know, a network of people that, you know, are committed to this struggle, committed to building the working struggle, and therefore we can lean on each other and, you know, realize that we're all resources to each other and like what we know, what we've done um, in order to, you know, be able to win, to be able to engage with people um, on something that speaks to them. so yeah, I think we'll wrap it here. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. A couple calls to action because you can't leave a conversation without that.
is um, you know follow us on Instagram or any any platform at Raise Up the South. Um, and I think I have like Know Your Rights cards in my purse. So I can put those out. And um, Monday, May fifteenth at five o'clock, we're gonna have an office warming party slash chapter meeting. So everybody should come out and have you know some grill whatever we put on the grill and um and listen to music and engage the workers and all that stuff so now we're our new office is at the ibew building which is uh 501 Napoleon street um so if we have your email and your phone and all that stuff we will phone thank you and, and all that yeah make sure you sign, have signed in make sure you signed in um follow our page there'll be a flyer up too that we'll post um, in the next few days, um, and I hope that this is not the last time I see any of you. And we should take a group picture. Yay! Yes. Mm -hmm. I do want to say one more thing, guys. Um, I really do want to try to encourage everybody to be more open with talking with your coworkers, even if it is, you know, start off a simple conversation, complain a little bit, like, oh, I'm tired of this job, whatever it is. Um, definitely. I encourage everybody else here to do their own part into growing this movement because it cannot happen without y'all. It cannot happen without me. It cannot happen without you. And um, like I said, you know, I even had no idea about what May Day is. And the more we teach the next person, then the next person teaches the next one mm -hmm. and so forth. But the point is definitely continue to do your part and that way this is everybody working for a bigger purpose because us workers all across the globe are all facing the same thing and enough is really enough Okay, Tasha, you can stop.